today's gospel, so my heavenly Father will do to every one of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, but what is he going to do? What is God going to do with us when we die? Isn't that one of the underlying questions that we all have, even if we don't express it? Isn't that something that, at least subconsciously, every person of faith, every person who even suspects that a God exists, worries about? What happens when I die? And if there's a God, is he going to treat me well or badly? Is he going to forgive me or condemn me? We'll hold on to that thought. Put it aside for a moment. And I'd ask you to imagine something for me or remember something with me. Something that's very personal to you. And it may be painful. I want you to call to mind someone who has really wronged you. I mean, not just took your seat on the bus. I mean, really set out to hurt you, right? Not someone you know, you. You probably don't have to think very hard. You know, you know what it is. You know who it is. And imagine what they did. We spend a lot of time in this life thinking and wondering what God is going to do with us when we die. I think today's gospel points us instead to the question, what are we going to do to each other, or rather, for each other while we live? Peter has been alternately the hero or the villain in many of our recent gospel stories in the past weeks. Today he's the straight man in a stage show, and he sets Jesus up for a parable. He asks him, Lord, how often when a person in the church wrongs me, should I forgive him? As many as a ridiculously high number, as many as seven times, And remember, numbers like 7 and 40 are metaphorical numbers. They mean the world was created in seven days, a long time. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, a long time. The people of Israel were in the wilderness 40 years, a long time. And Jesus replies, no, not 7, but 77, a really big number. An infinite number. We refer in him and in scripture to Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. I would put to you he's also King of metaphor and Lord of hyperbole. Jesus is always overstating it. And he frequently does so in his parables. Remember, a parable is a story that answers one question. What is the kingdom of God like? The kingdom of God is like a man who had a vineyard. The kingdom of God is like a man who had a hundred sheep. The kingdom of God is like a king who had a slave who came to him. What is clear is that Jesus was not giving us advice about animal husbandry, enology, or commerce because the advice was not capitalistic or even home economic. 
It was about the economy and the kingdom of God, not our daily lives. For reference, in case you aren't familiar with the exchange rate from first century Palestinian Roman Palestine to today, a denarius is what a laborer would be given for a day's work. $15 an hour today in Connecticut is minimum wage, so that's $120. A talent is worth 6,000 denarii. Now, in case you can't do higher math instantly, that means that the first slave that came to the king had a debt of $7.2 billion in Connecticut in 2023. Yes, the Lord of Hyperbole is speaking here. I think it highly unlikely that a slave in first century Palestine had worked up a $7.2 billion debt. Be that as it may, he's trying to make a point, and what is it? It was big. And then he turned to someone who had only worked up a $12,000 debt, and he wouldn't forgive. Jesus is making a point. To err is human, to forgive, divine. And yet how hard it is to forgive, call to mind again, that person who really stuck it to you, who really wronged you. Have you had it in your heart to forgive her, to forgive him? Put it aside for a second. I'll share from my own experience when I first came to New York City as a 20-something-year-old seminarian, and I had a beagle. I've always had beagles. We were walking up 8th Avenue, at approaching 23rd Street at the time of year, just about this time of year, when uh, approaching what is called Manhattan Hinge, when the sun aligns with the cross streets, and therefore, when you have crosstown traffic and the sun is setting over the Hudson River, it's directly in your eyes as you're driving. And so it was this Sunday late afternoon, and a BMW, I still remember, it was black, came hurtling westward from 7th Avenue up to the 8th Avenue intersection just as an old woman was making her way across the street. And she didn't quite make the light, and the light had turned red, and he didn't see her. And he must have been driving 45, 50 miles an hour. And all I heard was thud as she flew into the air and over the car and down onto the pavement instantly dead. Welcome to New York. Everyone on the street, and there were probably 300 people, stopped. And then, and you've experienced this, when you drop a piece of meat from the barbecue and it falls to the ground, with an instant, ants cover it. They, as if they come from nowhere. There's a mountain of ants on that chunk of ground beef that's fallen. 300 New Yorkers descended on this BMW, which Miracle of Miracles had actually pulled over in this day before surveillance cameras. He could easily have been on the West Side Highway and out of town. He had stopped, and they surrounded it like the angry mob that they had become. Clearly, this man had killed this woman, and they were going to make sure he didn't get away. I was new to New York. I didn't know how things were handled. This was 
before things got better in New York, I thought I was about to witness a second death, and my dog and I kept our distance. The police arrived. The man unlocked his doors, got out with them, and the crowd dissipated. The ambulance attended to the woman's body, and the man sat down on the curb. And a few of the crowd stayed around to make sure he didn't go anywhere. Well, I didn't know what to do. But I asked myself, in this new position of seminarian, someone studying to be a priest, what, what am I supposed to do here? I had the same anger as the crowd toward the man. But what, what could I possibly do? The, the woman was dead. And the image from scripture in my mind was let the dead bury the dead, attend to the living. So I sat down next to the man on the curb. This is not Ian the hero, this is Ian, what can I possibly do here? I thought, he's in agony. He's condemned himself. He doesn't need any more condemnation. He needs someone's presence next to him. So I sat next to him, not to absolve him, but to be present with him. And then my dog, after about five minutes, started to lick his hand. And he burst into tears. And I gave him my card. And I said, if I can do anything. And I left him. People have been out to get me from time to time. I'm not paranoid. Sometimes they are out to get you. And it was just a year ago, there was someone in a former congregation that was out to actually do me harm. And I'd just been called to a, another church called St. Michael's a year ago. And I went off on retreat to, say, to Holy Cross Monastery, happy that I'd been called to a new church and didn't have to hang around the woman who was out to get me. And yet, I wanted to come to Litchfield, but Litchfield hadn't called. And I sat there in my cell at Holy Cross, and all I could do was imagine revenge scenarios against the woman who was out to get me. Well, I'm happy now, I'm gonna leave, and boy, what am I gonna say to her? I'm really gonna stick it to her. I'm really gonna get my own back. I'm really gonna I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna sin. And I was up at 3 a.m. figuring out how I could sin. And I said, what's wrong with this picture? A lot. And I prayed over and over again with this Orthodox rosary, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on a sinner, and he wouldn't have mercy on me because I was still sinning, even as I was asking for mercy. And finally, I, I threw that away, and I said, I give up. I forgive her. And I fell asleep. And that Sunday, Litchfield called and said, come be our priest. Forgiveness isn't what we do to people who don't deserve it. It's what we do because God does it to us. It's what we do because forgiveness is the human expression of divine love. We do it because we breathe. We do it because we are created in God's image and God's very breath is forgiveness of his people. When we have the opportunity to forgive, we have the obligation to forgive. Yes, it's difficult. Anything worth doing is. 
And yet I know from personal experience, as you do, if we don't forgive, we live our lives as bitter, twisted, angry people. And the moment we let go, we let God enter our lives. We let Him take over, and joy is possible. So my Heavenly Father will do to every one of you what will he do? I choose not to focus on the uh, condemnatory end of this gospel, but rather on its flip side. What will he do? I look forward to the day when he won't look at me and say, wicked slave, and send me off to be tortured until I forgive and pay back my debt. But elsewhere in the gospel, when you look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into the joy of thy Lord. May that day be for you and for me today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.